Hi, this is Brad Constantine, and you've reached the Book of Mormon Lecture Series. I've been teaching seminary and institute for the last 11 years, and uh, this is an attempt to do a deep dive into the Book of Mormon itself. I'm hoping that you'll find this uplifting and edifying. This is not an official recording of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but every attempt has been made to be as doctrinally accurate as possible. So if you're ready for a deep dive into the Book of Mormon, here we go. Hi, and welcome back to the Book of Mormon podcast. This is going to be a discussion of Mormon chapter 2. So we're, again, still talking about Mormon here, and as the wickedness of the Nephites continues to grow, and the Gadianton robbers and property becoming slippery, uh, that's where we are with chapter 2. Verse 1, And it came to pass in that same year that there began to be a war again, so they've had four years of peace between the Nephites and the Lamanites, and notwithstanding I being young, he's 16 years old now, was large in stature. Sounds kind of like Nephi, doesn't it? Therefore, the people of Nephi appointed me that I should be their leader or the leader of their armies. I wonder what the rest of them must have looked like if he's the if he's the leader. We may conclude that Mormon received the priesthood at a very tender age. He was only ten years old when Ammaron counseled him and placed him placed in him the wonderful trust as guardian of the sacred plates. Moreover, when he was fifteen years of age, he had a visitation by the Lord and tasted and knew of the goodness of Jesus. It appears that Mormon was appointed to lead the Nephite armies into battle against the Lamanites, not so much because of his physical stature, but more likely because he was indeed a remarkable leader in many aspects of his life. We are left only to surmise all of the reasons why Mormon was thrust into weighty responsibilities while so young. The record does not detail all of the greatness and unique qualifications of Mormon. Uh, Mormon, the record keeper, was also modest and humble, and that was by Millet McConkie. Verse 2, Therefore it came to pass that in my sixteenth year I did go forth at the head of an army of the Nephites against the Lamanites. Therefore three hundred and twenty and six years had passed away. Sterling W. Sill said, If you think it is an, an inspiration that a sixteen-year-old boy could win the leadership of a great national army, what would you think of a man between the ages of sixty-five and seventy-four, who was still the best man among his entire people for this top position of leadership, and in those days the general marched at the head and not in the rear of his troops? It is one thing to shoot a guided missile at an enemy a thousand miles away, but it is quite another thing to meet the enemy face to face, and with a sword or a battle axe take on all comers, old and young, on any basis they might choose to elect and still be in there fighting at age 74. No weakling or coward survives a test like that. His leadership and great skill in battle must have been an inspiration to those fortunate companions in arms who were privileged to fight at his side. And that was uh, by Daniel Ludlow. Uh, sorry, Sterling Sill, who was quoted by Daniel Ludlow. Verse 3, And it came to pass that in the 320 and 7th year the Lamanites did come upon us with exceedingly great power, insomuch that they did frighten my armies, therefore they would not fight, and they began to retreat towards the land north, toward the north countries. This is the beginning of the migration to the north toward the land, or toward the hill Shim and Cumorah. And it came to pass that we did come to the city of Angola, and we did take possession of the city, and make preparations to defend ourselves against the Lamanites. And it came to pass that we did fortify the city with our might, but notwithstanding all our fortifications, the Lamanites did come upon us, and did drive us out of the city. And they did also drive us forth out of the land of David. And we marched forth, and came to the land of Joshua, which was in the borders, and borders west by the seashore. And it came to pass that we did gather in our people as fast as it were possible that we might get them together in one body. But behold, the land was filled with robbers and with Lamanites, and notwithstanding the great destruction which hung over my people, they did not repent. <clears throat> the more wicked they became, the harder it was to repent. Elder Talmadge said, As the time of repentance is procrastinated, the ability to repent grows weaker. Neglect of opportunity in holy things develops inability. Continuing 8, uh, they did not repent of their evil doings, therefore there was blood and carnage spread throughout all the face of the land, both on the part of the Nephites and also on the part of the Lamanites, and it was one complete revolution throughout all the face of the land. And now that Lamanites had a king, and his name was Aaron, and he came against us with an army of forty and four thousand, and behold, I withstood him with forty and two thousand, and it came to pass that I did beat him with my army, that he fled before me. And behold, all this was done, and three hundred and thirty years had passed away. And it came to pass that the Nephites began to repent of their iniquity, and began to cry, even as had been prophesied by Samuel the Lamanite. For behold, no man could keep that which was his own, for the thieves, and the robbers, and the murderers, and the magic art, and the witchcraft which was in the land. 
Hugh Nibley said, the first two chapters of Mormon give a wonderful description of the complete breakdown of a civilization, and it was one complete revolution throughout all the face of the land. Recent studies have shown that when the Roman Empire collapsed, all of a sudden, just such vast roving and plundering bands filled the earth as those described in the Book of Mormon. Insecurity was complete. People took refuge in sorceries and witchcrafts and magics. The dark ages were upon them. No man could keep that which was his own for the thieves and the robbers and the murderers and the magic art and the witchcraft which was in the land. Everyone was a possible victim here. Nobody was safe. Total insecurity. And this is the way you feel today if you want to walk around in some of our inner cities. Everybody's, everybody is befuddled by these magic arts. It's the mystique of the gangs and the graffiti. They get themselves up in fantastic spooky costumes, paint their faces, draw their weird graffitis, and have their secret signs. And again, that was by Hugh Nibley. Verse 11, thus there began to be a mourning and a lamentation in all the land because of these things, and more especially among the people of Nephi. And it came to pass that when I, Mormon, saw their lamentation and their mourning and their sorrow before the Lord, my heart did begin to rejoice within me, knowing the mercies and the long suffering of the Lord. Therefore, supposing that he would be merciful unto them, that they would again become a righteous people. But behold, this my joy was vain, for their sorrowing was not unto repentance. The tears the Nephites shed did not flow from hearts that were broken and spirits that were contrite. Their sorrow stemmed not from faith in Christ, but rather from a hopelessness and despair which cometh because of iniquity. And that was by Millet McConkie. Continuing verse 13, because of the goodness of God, but it was rather the sorrowing of the damned, because the Lord would not always suffer them to take happiness in sin. President Kimball said, often people indicate that they have repented when all they have done is to express regret for a wrong act. But true repentance is marked by that godly sorrow that changes, transforms, and saves. To be sorry is not enough. Perhaps the felon in the penitentiary, coming to realize the high price he must pay for his folly, may wish he had not committed the crime. That is not repentance. The vicious man who is serving a stiff sentence for rape may be very sorry he did the deed, but he is not repentant if his heavy sentence is the only reason for his sorrow. That is the sorrow of the world. The truly repentant man is sorry before he is, he is apprehended. He is sorry even if his secret is never known. He desires to make voluntary amends. Repentance of the godly type means that one comes to recognize the sin and voluntarily and without pressure from outside sources begins his transformation. Elder Maxwell said, recognition is a sacred moment. Real remorse floods the soul. False remorse, instead of like fondling our failings, in ritual regret, we mourn our mistakes, but without mending them. The natural man never picks up the cross. His is the sorrowing of the damned, which involves regret, but not necessarily over the sin itself. Instead, it is because these sorrowers can no longer take pleasure in sin. Quite a difference, for the natural man still clings not to the cross, but to his old ways. We see so much sorrowing of the damned, this by those of a, in a psychological no-man's land. These individuals can no longer take pleasure in sin, but they do not fully repent either. They hope somehow to be saved in their sins instead of being willing to give away all their sins in order to know God. But modern sinners demand that modern science do just that. They claim as their right freedom from consequences the, the suspension of the cause-effect principle when it interferes with their desires. And that was by Rodney Turner. Hugh Nibley said, the classic example of this we have with us now. We never knew such a perfect case of sorrowing of the damned. Sor sorrow for their sins? For what have they done? No, but because the Lord would not always suffer them to take happiness in sin. What's the attitude of people with AIDS? They sorrow, they suffer, they may, they may want a cure. We have to do something. They have to be saved, but never do they show any inclination to repent of what brought the thing on. If we only had the cure, then they could continue in their own ways and feel happy about it. They sort of resent being unable to do that. They sorrow, but it's the sorrow of the damned, and they sorrow just for one reason, that they can't go on doing the very thing that's brought them into this terrible path. If they had a chance, they'd go right on doing it forever. The Lord must call a halt here sometime, so here's how he's going to do it. Verse 14, and they did not come unto Jesus with broken hearts and contrite spirits, but they did curse God and wish to die. Nevertheless, they would struggle with the sword for their lives. And it came to pass that my sorrow did return unto me again, and I saw that the day of grace was passed with them, both temporally and spiritually. President Kimball said, it is true that the great, part, the great principle of repentance is always available, but for the wicked and rebellious, there are serious reservations to this statement. For instance, sin is intensely habit-forming and sometimes moves men to the tragic point of no return. 
Without repentance, there can be no forgiveness, and without forgiveness, all the blessings of eternity hang in jeopardy. As the transgressor moves deeper and deeper in his sin, and the error is entrenched more deeply, and the will to change is weakened, it becomes increasingly nearer hopeless, and he skids down and down until either he does not want to climb back up, or he has lost the power to do so. One of the greatest principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the principle of repentance. However, if one has sinned so seriously and has and becomes habitually a sinner, the spirit of repentance leaves and he may or may not be able to repent. That last part was by Harold B. Lee. Continuing verse 15, For I saw thousands of them hewn down in open rebellion against their God, and heaped up as dung upon the face of the land, and thus three hundred and forty and four years had passed away. And it came to pass in the three hundred and forty and fifth year, the Nephites did begin to flee before the Lamanites, and they were pursued until they came even to the land of Jash Jashon, before it was possible to stop them in their retreat. And now the city of Jashon was near the land where Amaron had deposited the records. So this is where the hill Shim is located unto the Lord, that they might not be destroyed. And behold, I had gone according to the word of Amaron, and taken the plates of Nephi, and did make a record according to the words of Amaron. Uh, Anthony Ivans said, It will be observed that at this time only the plates of Nephi were, were removed from the hill Shem by Mormon. Verse 18, And upon the plates of Nephi I did make a full account of all the wickedness and abominations, but upon these plates, in other words, the plates that Mormon is translating or abridging, uh, the gold plates, I did forbear to make a full account of their wickedness and abominations. I just lost my place. Okay, where am I here? Uh, for behold, a continual scene of wickedness and abominations has been before my eyes ever since I have been sufficient to behold the ways of man. When Amaron turned the responsibility of the records over to Mormon, he indicated that Mormons should engrave on the plates of Nephi all the things that he had observed concerning his people. Thus, Mormon's major record of the events of his day was written on the large plates of Nephi. <clears throat> However, later in his life, he was commanded by the Lord to make a separate set of plates, the plates of Mormon. He then abridged onto his own plates all of the writings from the large plates of Nephi, including his own writings. Concerning his writings on these two sets of plates, Mormon said, And upon the plates of Nephi I did make a full account of all the wickedness and abominations, but upon these plates, the plates of Mormon, I did forbear to make a full account of their wickedness and abominations. Earlier in his writings, Mormon indicated he did not write on the plates of Mormon even one hundredth part of the things that were written on the large parts on the large plates of Nephi. And that was by Victor Ludlow or by Daniel Ludlow or Victor Ludlow. I'm not sure which. Okay. Verse 19. And woe is me because of their wickedness, for my heart has been filled with sorrow because of their wickedness in all my days. Nevertheless, I know that I shall be lifted up at the last day. Mormon had his calling and election made sure. What, is, what this is showing us is that we can still be righteous in a terribly wicked world. One great objective of our lives should be to make our calling and election sure, that is, to so live that we receive assurance from the Lord, that when this life is over, we shall be exalted and dwell with him. Mormon may have had this blessing, as did other Nephite prophets, for he tells us, I know that I shall be lifted up the last day. Those members of the church who denote them, who devote themselves wholly to righteousness, living by every word that proceedeth forth from the mouth of God, make their calling and election sure. That is, they receive the more sure word of prophecy, which means that the Lord seals their exaltation upon them while they are yet in this life. The more sure word of prophecy means a man's knowing that he is sealed up unto eternal life by revelation and the spirit of prophecy through the power of the holy priesthood. The prophet, for one, had this seal upon him, placed upon him. To him, deity said, I am the Lord thy God, and will be with thee even unto the end of the world, and through all eternity. For verily I seal upon you your exaltation, and prepare a throne for you in the kingdom of my father, with Abraham your father. That was by Elder McConkie. We can only read between the lines and wonder how we could remain how he could remain faithful and righteous under such adverse conditions and how he could maintain a personal hope when he was so often filled with sorrow and discouragement at the sins of his society implicit in this statement is the special spiritual blessing mormon had received which was an anchor to his soul amidst the turmoil and troubles of his life it seems clear that he had obtained the more sure word of prophecy the sure knowledge that he was sealed up unto eternal life this is linked with his having received the second comforter, the presence of the Savior. The prophet Joseph Smith urged 
often urge the saints to go on and continue to call upon God until you make your calling and election sure for yourselves by obtaining this more sure word of prophecy and wait patiently for the promise until you obtain it. <clears throat> One receives these blessings only after, as Joseph taught, the Lord has thoroughly proven him and finds that the one that the man is determined to serve him at all hazards. The realization that these blessings were his most assuredly kept Mormon from becoming overcome with sorrow or debilitated with discouragement and also provided the spiritual strength he most needed to continue to succor and serve as an unresponsive, unappreciative, hardened, and iniquitous people. Verse 20, And it came to pass that in this year the people of Nephi again were hunted and driven, and it came to pass that there were driven that they were that we were driven forth until we had come northward to the land which was called Shem. And it came to pass that we did fortify the city of Shem, and we did gather in our people as much as it were possible that perhaps we might save them from destruction. Our information on the timing of warfare in this area has not been examined comprehensively by scholars. <clears throat> what is known is consistent, for example, with the fact that in Yucatan, wars were usually fought between October and the end of January or February in other Mesoamerican regions. In that, in that period, travel was rarely restricted due to bad weather. It was still relatively cool, and food was available either by supply from the logistical base or by taxing the subjugated. The schedule varied slightly depending on local topography and climate. The corn crop, fundamental in the diet everywhere in Mesoamerica, is typically planted in April or May, just before the rains begin and after the fields have been cleared and the rubbish burned. It can be harvested about the time when the clouds and rain taper off, the wettest months are July and September for most regions, and the temperature rises because of greater sunshine. Harvest is from October to December again, depending on locality and, and on crop variety. The crucial time for agricultural labor under this regime is and was anciently March through May. At other times, being away was inconvenient but not critical. Probably the segment of time freest from field work for the typical cultivator warrior was November through February, which of course coincides with the war season. Under emergency conditions, naturally, some military action could go on, though hampered throughout most of the year. Verse 22, And it came to pass in the 340 and sixth year they began to come up against us. And it came to pass that I did speak unto my people and did urge them with great energy that they would, they would stand boldly before the Lamanites and fight for their wives and their children and their houses and their homes. God and religion are missing from the list of things to fight for, you notice. This was on the title of Liberty of Moroni. And my, my words did arouse them somewhat to vigor, insomuch that they did not flee from before the Lamanites, but did stand with boldness against them. And it came to pass that we did contend with an army of 30,000 against an army of 50,000. And it came to pass that we did stand before them with such firmness that they did flee from before us. And it came to pass that when they had fled, we did pursue them with our armies and did meet them again and did beat them. Nevertheless, the strength of the Lord was not with us. Yea, we were left to ourselves that the spirit of the Lord did not abide in us. Therefore, we had become weak without the Holy Ghost and the help of the Lord, like unto our brethren. By using his own people as an example, Mormon provides us with a significant doctrinal teaching concerning the strength of the Lord that comes by the power of the Holy Ghost through personal righteousness. I know in the strength of the Lord thou canst do all things, Lamoni testified. There is a real power, both physical and spiritual, that can come into the life of every man or woman who is filled with the Holy Ghost. That power constitutes the strength of the Lord, a divine unlimited power. Without that strength and power, we are left only with the limited mortal abilities of man. Mormon informs us that his people were without the Spirit, having no claim upon the infinite powers and strengths of God. Being cut off from the blessings of the Spirit, they were left to their own natural abilities, which were infinitely inferior to the strength of the Lord. <clears throat> Thus, they were, they were nothing special or unique. They were just like any other natural man. Ammon clearly understood the difference between the strength of the Lord and mortal man's weaknesses. He testified, I know that I am nothing, as to my strength I am weak. Therefore, I will not boast of myself, but I will boast of my God, for in his strength I can do all things. This important doctrinal message was also forcefully impressed upon the heart and soul of the young prophet Joseph Smith after the loss of the 116 manuscript pages of the Book of Mormon. To him the Lord declared, for although a man may have many revelations and have power to do many mighty works, yet if he boasts in his own strength, and sets at naught the counsels of God, and follows after the dictates of his own will and carnal desires, he must fall and incur the vengeance of a just God upon him. 
The Lord further instructed Joseph to be faithful and repent of his sins, and then again warned, Except thou do this, thou shalt be delivered up and become as other men. To ensure that we do not disqualify ourselves from having the strength of the Lord, we must live our lives in such a way as not to repel the Spirit. By being faithful, obedient, penitent, and spiritually vigilant, we can have the companionship of the Holy Ghost, which strengthens and protects in both physical and spiritual ways. Verse 27, And my heart did sorrow because of this the great calamity of my people, because of their wickedness and their abominations. For behold, we did go forth against the Lamanites and the robbers of Gadianton, until we had again taken possession of the lands of our inheritance. And the three hundred and forty and ninth year had passed away. And in the three hundred and fiftieth year we, we made a treaty with the Lamanites and the robbers of Gadianton, in which we did get the lands of our inheritance divided. And the Lamanites did give unto us the land northward, yea, even to the narrow passage which led into the land southward. And we did give unto the Lamanites all the land southward. So that's uh, they're, so they're going to now divide up the lands among themselves, uh, Nephites in one place and Lamanites in another. Uh, and then we're going to see here how they uh, begin to uh, gather together here in the next uh, little while to uh, fight against each other in a final battle. I bear testimony that these sad things are true, that this happened, and, and that we're, we're reading from translated material. And I bear that testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. See you next time.